first of all, my, apology, uh, my apologies to Takeshi Saito and all the people in Japan because the original plan was to give this talk in June in Japan. <coughs> uh, but, well, at least I can give it now in Paris. Um, and also, my apologies to the people in Paderborn because I would give the same talk as I gave there. So, I want to talk about Shimura varieties with infinite level and toy in the cohomology of local symmetric spaces, and I want to first start with these Shimura varieties, and in fact, I'll probably restrict myself to discussing this in the case of the modular curve, which is already interesting in itself. So, so let me recall what <coughs> the classical theory of uh, the complex numbers. So over C, you get the modular curve by looking at the upper half plane, so a set of complex numbers of positive imaginary part. And then you fix the congruent subgroup gamma in SL2 of the integers. <coughs> and so this x on the upper half plane, and then you get the modular curve at level gamma. Just the quotient of H by this complex subgroup. And so this parameterizes some elliptic curves with the upper structure. <coughs> and so the picture I want to, so there's a picture that I want to get also over the periodic numbers, and so the picture is the following. <coughs> So you have H, which is roughly, well not quite exactly, but roughly the inverse limit over the modular curves at all levels. And so just by definition, this Poincaré upper half plane embeds into the projective space over the complex numbers. <coughs> and in fact, you can give a modular interpretation to this. So you can consider H also in terms of this modular description as parameterizing pair E alpha, where E is the elliptic curve over C. And alpha is an isomorphic, it's a trivialization of the first singular homology of E. <coughs> and in terms of this modular interpretation, what is the map? So you take a pair E alpha. So orientation preserving trivialization, if you want. Uh, yes, sorry, orientation preserving. Well, in fact, I mean, later on I will also confuse. I mean, I said this is a modular curve, but usually you take several connected components and I will confuse the two points of view later on. So, oh. well, anyway, um, and what you do is you see senses to um, the Hodge filtration. So, what's the Hodge hot filtration? So, um, why is it map alpha? You can identify uh, C2 with the complex homology of E. And why uh, some of the exponential map, <coughs> this is, uh, no, what do I want to say? Well, anyway, this subjects on to the algebra of E, uh, which is not true. <coughs> and so this gives a one dimensional quotient of the fixed two dimensional vector space and thus an element of P1. And so we want a similar picture of a CP. And so clearly we have need some Hodge filtrations uh, to talk about this. So thus I want to uh, recall a little bit about Hodge filtrations over CP. <coughs> Or in fact, I mean, one can replace CP by any algebraic closed extension of QP. So let's C over QP be algebraic closed in QP. And let's take any proper smooth variety over C. And Well, then there's this classical theorem of Hodge, probably 
if I put only proper here, then maybe I also need some additional reduction arguments, maybe due to the mean. Um, that there is a such neuron spectral sequence and it degenerates. So, neuron spectral sequence. Um, <coughs> up too high. Okay, um, so it starts from the E1 page, and at the E1 page you have Fox cohomology, and this converges to the wrong cohomology. <coughs> and so the theorem is that this degenerates at the, at the first page already. And so this means that so of course this proof by the left chest principle choosing an isomorphism maybe between C and the complex numbers and then using complex analysis there. Um, so it's degenerates at E1, and so thus we get a hodge to round filtration <coughs> on the round cohomology. <coughs> whose successive quotients are hodge cohomology. <clears throat> but if you look back at what we wanted to do here, so we wanted to have a filtration on on the singular cohomology, and of course over C that's not a problem because the singular cohomology, if you change it with C, is canonically kind of isomorphic to the round cohomology. So the Hodge, Hodge to round filtration is good, but uh, <clears throat> over C pieces is no longer true. So uh, if you take the entire homology of x to keep the coefficient, say, <coughs> that is up to c, it's not canonically at least isomorphic to uh, the wrong homology of x. And so we can't use this to produce a filtration on the entire homology. And then, of course, if you locate a cost series, then you wouldn't even expect such a statement to be true, but you would rather expect that such a statement is true after you tensor with B to ROM, but not even then it's true. <coughs> As my base field C doesn't embed into contents field B to ROM. <coughs> so if this guy was defined over some discretely valued extension, maybe this perfect residue field, um, then such a statement would be true, but if, if my writing starts live only over an algebraically closed field, that's no longer true. <coughs> so we need some other illustration to make sense of this, and fortunately this, such, such a illustration. Um, so there is another spectral sequence which looks very similar, but has some interesting twists in it. So let's just not take spectral sequence. <coughs> um, which again starts from Hodge cohomology, but this time on the E2 page. And I'm not making any typos here, I'm really being careful. So it interchanges i and j. And you have to put a tail twist here. And converges again. Well, not again, but this time it converges to a tall homology. <coughs> so, um, as I'm only working over C, it probably doesn't make much sense to um, put a tail twist here, but what is meant is that in this way it's canonical, and if my variety is defined over some smaller field. It converges to HI plus G. Oh, sorry, HI plus J. Uh, if it's defined over smaller fields, that with these state twists, everything will be Galois invariant. Uh, and this also degenerates already. That's the first page, which is this 22. And thus, you also get a filtration on a tall cohomology tensor with C, whose successive quotients are again Hodge cohomology. And this filtration I call the Hodge state filtration.
So it is the one that gives the odd state the composition. Like it is the one which gives the odd state the composition. So assuming your variety is already defined over a discretely valid extension of QP with perfect residue field, then it follows from the scholarly covariance that it has to degenerate because there can be no differentials between no dollar covariant differentials in here. And also, there are no extensions and no maps between those. So this implies that actually this filtration is canonically split by using the Galois action. But that's only true if it's defined over a discretely valued extension. And so, uh, <clears throat> in general, this is really just a filtration and it's not canonically split. Give an example for this. What does this look like? So, in the case of interest, so that we take an elliptic curve over a periodic field now. Uh, then, of course, we have a. We can look at the first Durand homology, say, of E, which you can define, say, as the algebra of the universal vector extension, or also as the dual of the Durand homology. And so this is a filtration where the quotient is not the real algebra. And well, for elliptic curves, maybe I wouldn't have to talk about the dual elliptic curve. But uh, well, in general, it's come out if you have put in the real variety here, then you would have to use the dual real variety here. And so you take the dual, real, dual elliptic curve, take the real algebra, and then the dual vector space. <coughs> and then there's another filtration where you take the Take module of E, and this is up to C, and so now the two terms are interchanged. So this, you know, this term is a co-kernel, and the Lie algebra appears as a sub. And in fact, to make it canonical, you have to put a tateless by one here. And so again, if this is defined over some small field, then uh, this implies that this is not state representation and this effect can only be the sum of the two terms, but not in general. <coughs> and over C, those two terms would be isomorphic, and also over C, this is also can only be split. <coughs> Let's get back to the modular curve now. <clears throat> so, um, we want to define a map which uh, so a parameter which is just giving by associating an, elliptic, associating an elliptic curve to this filtration here. And to do so, we of course have to trivialize the chaotic Tate module. But note that this time we only have to trivialize the chaotic Tate module and not the whole integral homology. So, we don't have to do anything at the primes away from P. And so, what do I do? So, uh, I let this be the eddic space So, I mean, that's just a fancy <coughs> version of a rigid analytic variety uh, over C associated with my modular curve. <coughs> well, upper I defined it as something over C, but say, say, well, I could argue that it's defined over a Q if I put some additional components, or I could also simply choose an isomorphism between C and Q be bound if it's to C. <coughs> uh, and so we want to trivialize the take module at P, so we have to take an inverse limit over all the levels at P. So let me choose the following notation so that gamma P to the M inside gamma be the principal congruence of this. So 
that would probably be more standard to write gamma cap gamma p to the ambit to keep notation simple. <coughs> Let's do it this way. Uh, again, I have to pay attention to the this is not too high. Okay. Um, okay, and then the theorem is that this picture, which we had was a complex number, it doesn't make sense with the Pianic numbers. So, um, for this, of course, we first have to uh, make sense, give some sense to this inverse limit over all levels at p. And um, we have to do some rigid analysis geometry, and so this means we have to take a lot of completions. And of course, completions are not generally well behaved if you're leaving the Neusserian setup. But if you want to take this inverse limit, we really have to leave the Neusserian setup. <coughs> and so we might run into a lot of technical problems. Um, but actually, we don't. So um, maybe there's some special kind of non Neusserian spaces. Spaces which are well behaved, and this is also of these perfect void spaces. Let us see um, such that. <coughs> well, I would like to say it is the inverse limit of these spaces, but as it turns out, the category I'm working in doesn't admit inverse limits, so. One has to use a slightly stronger notion, which I call being similar to the inverse limit. What does it mean being similar to? So these edit spaces, um, they are actually locally ring spaces equipped with some variations. So you don't have to talk. So they really have an underlying topological space and not just some group and topos. And this condition means, first of all, that you get a homeomorphism on underlying topological spaces. That's a condition which says roughly that takes the direct limit of the structure sheets at finite level and maps this to the structure sheet at infinite level, so that's this has image. <coughs> but the problem is that there is no canonical topology you can put on this direct limit. So there would be the direct limit topology, but it's not of the good kind. So you take the topology which the bar of topology which makes the open unit ball set of power one elements in here. So this becomes perfect time. Well anyway, it's a technical issue. But the second part now says that on this infinite level guy, um, this hot state period that is defined. So next this The period map uh, <coughs> on my elliptic curve at infinite level going to well, the x space associated with spin. <coughs> and it has a bunch of good properties. So it's f in some sense. Meaning that there is a covering by this P1 by affinity subspaces whose pre-images 
uh, finite perfectoid subspaces of this infinite little guy. Um, and it also can be used with hack operators. And so what does this mean? So this is defined over a periodic field of P1. So G of G, QP certainly acts on this guy. And of course, I should write this here. Um, as we know, at infinite level, we have an honest group action of this group on the space, not just uh, some hacker correspondences. And so it's G of QP equivariant. Um, also, it's equivalent for the hack operators away from P. What does this mean? So, we have some non-trivial hack operators here, but it's not clear how they should act here, but in fact, they just don't act. So, uh, So there's a natural ample line bundle given by the dual of the Lie algebra of the universal elliptic curve on this modular space here. Then there is, of course, a natural ample line bundle on P1, or of 1. In fact, they're compatible. So the natural line bundle omega on this modular space is just a pullback. And in general, there's such kind of a statement for uh, automorphic vector bundles. So in general, for some Shimura variety, you will get some maps map some flag variety. And on this flag variety, you will have naturally find some automorphic vector bundles. And if you pull them back, you get some automorphic vector bundles on your Shimura variety. Right? That's, after all, <coughs> how you define automorphic vector bundles in the complex setup. The same is okay here. <coughs> And also, it's true that this map extends to the minimal compactification. <coughs> oh. You so mean that the yeah. tower of minimal compactification is also good, uh, gives a perfect. Yeah, well, it's, so if I could put, I mean, if I denote by star the minimal compactification, then uh, I mean, this theorem is also true. Uh, I should put star here and should put a star everywhere. And actually, it's more when I say this, I realize that uh, to make this f I actually have to talk about some minimal compactification. Um, because otherwise, I remove some cusp and this is not. I should put some minimal compactification here. Uh, of course, I should say what the map is, so if you take some uh, guide infinite level, which is essentially an elliptic curve plus a trivialization of the periodic tape module, and maybe some additional structure away from that I don't care about, um, then this maps is to <coughs> Well, this was fashion there. Sitting inside TP of the tangent ZPC, which is why uh, this isomorphism is alpha the same as C squared. <coughs> but note that there is some interesting twist happening here, namely, over the complex numbers, the D algebra appeared as a quotient, whereas now it appears as a submodule. Um,
I want to make a cover of remarks in this. <coughs> um, so the first thing I would say is the reinterpretation of this P1 that appears on the left, on the right hand side, and also of what the map actually does. So for this I have to recall a theorem that appears in joint work with Gerrit Weinstein <coughs> and says the following. So um, again I have my algebraic close and complete extension. Let's see. Uh, with O C and C the ring of integers. <coughs> and then I can look at P divisible groups over the string of integers. <coughs> and it turns out that uh, the such J filtration that you find, of course, it depends only on the periodic cohomology, and so in some sense you would expect that it only depends on the associated periods of the group. And so this turns out to be true, so there's also a straight filtration defined for periods of the groups. And that's actually, that actually classifies those. So uh, the category is equivalent to the category of pairs lambda w, say, where uh, lambda is a tape module, so it's a finite free P module. And w is just a And so this map sends the P of group G <coughs> to its periodic state module in such state situation. So this is some kind of periodic analog of Riemann's classification of abelian varieties over the complex numbers. And of course, it's also used in a similar way here. Um, oh, and I want to make some remarks that if I have an abelian variety over OC, <coughs> uh, a variety. then the state filtration of A is the same as the log state filtration. The P of the group, <coughs> which has an independent definition, which is in fact much simpler. So there's a very simple definition of such state filtration of the P of the group for the first that appeared in the work of Faltings. I'm not exactly sure. Um, and that used law was a used law by far, and so that's where I learned this. <coughs> so what does this mean? Um, this means that we can regard, so after trivializing this periodic state module, um, well, giving the sort of state filtration is the same thing as giving the p of the group. And so this means that in geometric points, at least on the locus of good reduction, so where we have the severe variety not over C, but really over the ring of integers. <coughs> The such state period map is a map taking a an elliptic curve to its associated period with the group. It's a map taking some new R from C. Remember in the trivial question, it's a tape module. Unfortunately, there is no generalization of this <coughs> Monsieur Monsieur at Weinstein, which works for other rings. So not doesn't work in a relative setup, and it doesn't even work for smaller fields. So, I mean, only on geometric points on the local foot reduction, there's this very direct description of what this map does, and in general, it's almost slightly different. <coughs> um, but uh, in fact, from this from this description of geometric points, you can actually deduce the equivariance properties. Maybe you can also do it differently. But. <coughs> so, 
So because it depends only on the p of the group, somehow it doesn't matter if you put if you use some hack operator away from p. <coughs> Um, so the next thing I want to explain is how this map looks like explicitly. So explicit description. <coughs> so you have your infinite level uh, modular curve and I mean, on the special fiber, you have a stratification into the ordinary locus and the super singular locus. And say, if I would compactify, <coughs> I would put all the cusps also into the ordinary locus. Um, and just by putting this back into the specialization map, uh, you get a similar stratification on the generic fiber. So this actually stratified into an ordinary part and super singular part. And so this maps to the P1. And <coughs> there's also a classical stratification studied on the P1 as an LX space, namely, you have the rational points inside there, and you have <coughs> their complement, which is usually called reinforced upper half space. And these compositions turn out to correspond, so I can put these arrows here, meaning that the ordinary locus is exactly the preimage of P1 of QP and the super singular locus is preimage of omega 2. And so what I want to do is ex define, uh, explain what these maps are on the strata. And they turn out to be very different. So, so already from this diagram you see that the ordinary locus is essentially contracted to points, and something non-trivial geometrically only happens on the super singular locus. <coughs> so, in particular, this map is not at all injective, as was the case of the complex numbers, but it really contracts a lot of stuff. <coughs> so what does the such <coughs> take period map do on the ordinary locus? On there, it just measures the position of the canonical subfield. So, because in the canonical case you have the canonical subgroup, and the ordinary case you have the canonical subgroup, which gives you a canonical one dimensional sub of your <coughs> p-divisible group. And if you pass the Tate modules to get a canonical one dimensional sub of your uh, <coughs> Gaelic Tate module, and that's after you tensor with C, this gives exactly the Z algebra there. <coughs> well, that's what happens there. Uh, but on, on the super singular locus, it's more involved, so, so what is a super singular locus? So that's some uh, <coughs> at level zero you just have a union of uh, open disks for all super singular points and then as you pass up to the up all the levels then what happens at all these disks is that you get these Lubin Tate towers. And so at infinite level what you get is just a finite disjoint union of Lubin Tate spaces at infinite level. <coughs> at infinite level. So, in joint work with Jared Weinstein, in the same work, we also proved that this is actually a perfectoid space by purely local arguments. <coughs> 
Uh, and Jared Weinstein can even write down explicit <coughs> equations for what the space is, which is pretty amazing because at finite levels you don't have explicit descriptions, but some of this infinite level guy is in some way simpler than all the finite level guys individually. <coughs> I mean, Jared Weinstein is also studying these explicit affinite subsets and they're trying to show that they realize local Langlands and for this it's very useful for him to work at infinite level because at finite level you don't have this explicit description. <coughs> uh, okay, and now there's this strange isomorphism between the two towers, between the Lumentate and the Greenfield Tower, which is due to faultings. And then developed in more detail by Fork and it's a precise setup that we need. I mean as an isomorphism of perfectoid spaces, it's in this paper with Stuart Weinstein, <coughs> that this is the same as Greenfield space at infinite level. <coughs> but Greenfield space, just by its definition, so this is a tower of finite detail covers of Greenfield space. So by its very definition, it will map down to Greenfield's upper half plane. And so that's actually what the object period map does. So the strange isomorphism between the two towers is somewhere built into this object period map. <coughs> And it feels a little strange that there is actually some uh, map of eddic spaces which realizes this because if you think that you start somewhere in the ordinary locus and then you run into the super singular locus then for a long time you will stay constant and then at some point you start to walk only. Um, but so that's not kind of behavior you know from finite type geometry but in this infinite, I mean, in this highly non serial situation that's actually possible. Uh, Uh, and maybe I'm only at three. Um, I mean, everything I said here for the modular curve, it also works uh, for more varieties of Hodge type. very lucky that I can just write more writers of Hodge type without having to think much because as it turns out he prefers proofs is for the Siegel, Siegel modular space of principally polarized abelian varieties <coughs> where it's quite a bit of work but then any Shimura variety of Hodge type is a closed sub variety there and then you can by formal arguments deduce everything you want uh, from that case so uh, that's very nice okay and now I want to talk about some applications of this. And so the crucial theorem is the following. Uh, <coughs> it says that you can always find congruences between Eisenstein series and cusp forms in some sense. And so the setup is the following. So let me take some or q bar more variety. Which is of what type? <coughs> and then the theorem is that any system of Hecker eigenvalues <coughs> which you can find in the compact to support cohomology, so it's 
question you're writing <coughs> with a torsion coefficient, <coughs> that, let's say I work with over Fp, um, can be lifted to a system of Fekker eigenvalues of a classical cost problem. So that's doing two things. So <coughs> it's saying that uh, any torsion class can be lifted to characteristic zero, which is a very interesting result. And it also says that anything which comes from the boundary can also, any Hecker eigenvalues which come from something from the boundary can also be realized as coming from something uh, which is a cusp form. So even if some of this classically this uh, these Eisen's associated Eisenstein series does not vanish mod p as a cusp, you can still find these convergences. Uh, and maybe I should say that in order to get this classical cusp form, I may have to increase the level at p. So here, uh, what kind of hacker operators you mean away from p? Or yeah, yeah, away from p. <coughs> well, my paper I only consider, well, no, okay, actually, at this point, I still consider the whole Hecker algebra away from P. Um, Talking about eigenways, maybe I want it to be commutative. But. <coughs> okay, and because um, by the work of many, many people, there are now very strong theorems asserting the existence of Galois representations for cusp forms, one can use, one can then reduce these Galois representations again and get Galois <coughs> representations for something which appears in this torsion cohomology group here. And so from this you get, from the first corollary, is the existence of Galois representations for uh, torsion classes. So let me fix some totally real OCM field. And let xk be the locally symmetric space. For the general linear group of any dimension over this field f. And so, except in very, very few cases, this will not be a Shimura variety. So if f is q and n is 2, then this is a modular curve. But essentially, outside this case, it's never a Shimura variety. So if f is totally real, it's very closely related to someone. <coughs> so already if f is q and n is 3, this is just some real manifold. Or if f is totally real, uh, totally imaginary and n is 2, then this is some three-dimensional hyperbolic manifold, so which has no algebraic structure at all. <coughs> um, but still, the Betty cohomology of this real manifold knows about color representations. So, uh, This is the goal representation. Rho from of the absolute guard group of F. And continues, of course. <coughs> to GLN FP bar. Uh, associated with it, meaning that in particular the traits of Rubinius elements will be the eigenvalues of some hack operators. So it's an old idea of Purcell that you should try to realize these locally symmetric spaces here as boundary components in the broader cell compactification of some unitary or symplectic Shimura varieties. So you have this unitary or symplectic Shimura variety, which has a 
compactification as a real manifold this, with corners, this Borisel compactification. And in there, these local symmetric spaces will appear. And that's like cohomology will contribute to the cohomology of this space as a boundary contribution. Uh, okay. And then you lift, lift this, which is some a priori and Eisenstein contribution, to something which is actually a cusp form. And then for this cusp form, you know how to attach color representations to it. And then, uh, well, here you so how do you know it's really contributory? So there is a boundary map, a boundary map, and you have to know that. <coughs> Um, well, there's a long exact sequence where two terms are the usual cohomology and the complex support cohomology of the space, and this other term is uh, essentially the scope. Yes. Let's ignore the other strata, you can do this by induction. Um, and so this means that the eigenvalues will appear either in usual cohomology or in complex support cohomology. Ah, the boundary ones, yes. yes. And but, but by concrete reality, it's somehow enough to make and shift them from one to the other. I mean, you have to dualize maybe the Galois representation in the end. But. So you know that your Hecke eigenvalues will, the system of Hecke eigenvalues will appear either in the cohomology or in the complex support cohomology of the Shimura variety. But if it appears in the usual cohomology only, then you can use concrete reality to get something in the complex support cohomology again. For this exactly the kind of assume that the boundary is like a hypersurface, so that no, no. Um, well, the the ah, board second modification has a property that the inclusion of the open part into all of it is a homotopy equivalent. So. Yeah, exactly. But okay, I understand. Okay, this is like the, the usual uh, is, is a real okay. Okay. And so there are also, there's also a version of the theorem where uh, I take z mod p to the n coefficients. And then in the inverse limit, you can get some results about characteristic zero stuff. <coughs> and so this way, you get the second corollary, which says that uh, for any regular so-called regular algebraic uh, cusp ball. Possible automorphic representation. Automorphic representation. Pi of GLN over F, F is above. Um, there exists a, and any isomorphism between C and QL bar or QP bar, um, there exists a continuous. Well, actually, it's almost everywhere on Remy file um, associated with this. Uh, and so, I should say that this was proved before I did uh, by Harris, Lund, Taylor, and so on. And so the point is that you can realize these regular algebraic representations in the cohomology of these local symmetric spaces with some coefficient systems. And, yeah. and it's conjecture that you can do without the irregular, but then you have no idea where to find these representations in which cohomology groups. So the simplest case would be the case of mass forms of eigenvalue a quarter for the Laplacian. In the case where the ground field is Q and N is equal to 2. So one has no idea how to attach color representations to them. OK. And so in the last few minutes, uh, let me try to explain the proof of this uh, theorem here. <coughs> 
So let me use the same notation for the associated edX space. Well, I probably also choose in some such isomorphism here, then that's just to see. So the first step is to use uh, some PLD Koch theory to rewrite this etal cohomology group there. But obviously, if you're interested in some torsion groups, so we need some kind of integral PLD Koch theory isomorphism. And usually, those only work if your variety has good or same as stable reduction or something like that. Um, but as I want to increase the level at P indefinitely, um, I can't expect that I can get through with such statements because it's very hard to find same as stable models for these Shimura varieties. Um, and so one needs a different kind of comparison result, whereas the thing you compare it to is a priori is still something mysterious. Uh, it's following the same statement, so it's a comparison result. The Trojan coefficients, which appears in my work uh, on Pedi Koch theory, uh, but is mirrored on, on a result of faulting. So. <coughs> So it says that um, if I look at the Tau cohomology group, <coughs> it's torsion coefficients. So it doesn't matter whether I compute it on the attic space or on the variety, it's the same. I have a general comparison result. Um, and if you tensor this up to OC mod P, <coughs> then you get a map to. Cohomology, well, actually, I have to go to the minimal, com minimal complexification here. <coughs> and that takes the cohomology of the following strange sheaf. It's sheaf i plus 1p. I'll explain it in a second. And in fact, this is not an isomorphism, but it's almost an isomorphism. In the sense of faulting, it's almost mathematics. So in all these proofs, there will be a lot of statements which are only almost true, but it won't matter in the end. <coughs> so what is I plus? So I plus is the intersection of I and O plus inside the structure sheaf, where this is the functions which vanish at the boundary <coughs> sheaf of cost forms. And this is the sheaf of functions bounded by one. And so this kind of cohomology group which appears here has several strange properties. So it's computed on the characteristic zero space, but it's, the sheaf is a characteristic P sheaf still. And it's still extremely important that you compute it on the etal side of the space. So this makes it a priori extremely hard to understand. Now I pass to infinite level at P. So the direct limit of all levels at P of this group. So if you are coefficients, ends it up to OC mod P. It is an almost isomorphism to guitar cohomology now computed at my infinite level Shimura variety with the same level Kp, and same sheaf. <coughs> and so now the task is to understand this group here. And so re remember that in the end, we wanted to go to classical cost forms, and we're already one step there because we already have the sheaf of cost forms, which appears 
here. <coughs> so the second step is to get rid of this etal side here. Um, so it says that you can actually also compute this now. Now that you're at infinite level, it doesn't matter anymore. So this is almost the same as Uh, and so this left hand side can actually be computed by a Cech complex. With respect to some affinoid cover. <coughs> and so, <coughs> what this relies on is some version of the almost purity theorem. And in fact, <coughs> And some of the almost purity theorem a priori only does something for the finite etal covers, and I really want to consider the whole etal side here. So one needs some slight refinement of it, but can prove it with the same methods. And it says that if I have some perfectoid of finite algebra, C algebra, say, and if I look at the associated affinoid perfectoid space, then you can compute the tall cohomology on x of <coughs> this O plus sheaf, and then there's a similar version for this I plus sheaf. Um, and it's actually what you think it should be, so at least almost. Uh, so it's R plus in degree 0 and 0 in positive degrees. So it's some kind of version of Tate's acyclicity theorem for the tall side. <coughs> But Tate's theorem would only apply if I don't put the plus here, so if I invert p. <coughs> but I really want the version without inverting p. And in classical rigid analytic geometry, this statement with, with the plus here is absolutely not true. So there's a whole lot of torsion in these groups in general. Uh, in fact, unbounded torsion if you don't, don't put some at least normality hypotheses. <coughs> but if, if you pass through this infinite level, then all this torsion will somehow go away. <coughs> okay, and so this means that, <coughs> so what are the terms in this complex here? So there are the sections on u of i plus, and in fact I can mod out p afterwards by this result there. Um, I use some of the p's. And so these are cusp forms of, inf on inf of infinite level defined on a finite subset. So <coughs> and remember that in the end, we want to get some Hecker eigenvalues in, in a classical cusp form. So what's left to do is approximate um, these cusp forms of infinite level, which are only defined on some finite subsets by globally defined cusp forms which are of finite level without messing up the Hecker eigenvalues. Approximate by <coughs> the classical meaning in particular of finite level. So in the step two, I use that the space is perfectoid. In the step three, I will use large state period map. So, so what? I mean, there are of course these usual techniques, say going back to Katz's paper on periodic modular forms, um, <coughs> how to 
extend how to make this procedure. So usually, you would be the ordinary locus, and then the solution is to multiply by the Hausen invariant. So what properties of the Hausen invariant do you need for this? So you need that the vanishing locus is exactly the super singular locus. So you can remove all poles by multiplying by a high enough power of the Hausen invariant. And the other property you need is that this uh, commutes with all Hecker operators away from P. So that it doesn't mess up uh, the Hecker eigenvalues. <coughs> and uh, so we need some analog of the Hasse invariant, and where do we, we get it from? So a solution. Uh, pull back any section. <coughs> Four of one, say. one wire as a hot state period net to get some kind of fake Hassan right? So because this hot state period map commutes with all the hacker operators away from P, any function that you pull back from there will automatically commute with these hacker operators. So this gives you this property. And <coughs> Then you need to see that there are enough of these uh, fake house invariants in some sense. And uh, this exactly comes down to the fact that this map is affine. So you can actually choose an affinity cover of your, of your, well, it's not P1 in general, but in the P1 say it's a modular curve case, pull it back so you get an affinity cover there. And that's the affinity cover with respect to which you compute this Chesh complex there. And so it's a weight one house invariant? Uh, it's a section of omega. It is a section, yeah, probably. Yeah. So for which affinity cover you know that the pullbacks is per, uh, per, uh, per Well, for example, for the standard cover of P1 by two closed balls, say. Well, the point is that this property, that the pullback is affinity, it's stable under passing through rational subsets. Yes. And it's stable under the action of the GL2QP. Yes. And so whenever you have some uh, open subset. So there is an open subset for which is true, which contains a uh, rational point. And then you can make the subset very large under the GL2QP action. Yes. And then basically any subset will be rational on one of those. And then you get it for almost all open subsets. So whenever you give me some explicit guy, I can somehow verify that for this subset it's okay. But you don't know it for all rational domains in P1. I guess for all rational domains, it should be okay. I mean, for all rational domains, it should be OK, I say. Ah, because you can put it inside. Okay. I can put it inside something where it's rational, and then, I mean, because I have very big subsets for which it is true using the GeoCQP action, and then it passes to rational subsets, I can get it for all rational domains, yeah. Ah, and all of the domains are, okay, are rational, OK. Ah, are they? In P1? Well, in P1, maybe, yeah. Yeah, I think okay. that it was classified around the world, anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah, then in 4P1, it's okay for one. But I mean, I only need to produce one if you need cover, and that's okay. Uh, okay, <coughs> let me stop. Questions from Tokyo, then Beijing, and then Paris. <laughs> <laughs> So that's how I can define it on the open Shimura variety. Um, and then I have to prove that it extends to the minimal compactification. 
And for this, I use some version of Riemann's, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, in Riemann's Sehbarkeitssatz, which says that <laughs> bounded function, so if you have some normal complex analytic space, and you have something seriously close inside there, and you have a function which is bounded on the complement of the seriously close subset, then it will extend through all the variety. Mm -hmm. And I prove some analog of this in the setting of particular spaces to show that the hot state period map automatically has to extend. Because in the field neighborhoods of the minimal complexification, I can show that the image will be bounded and then it makes it mm. So, uh, so you see, uh, so you, you tell us, uh, you told us this experiment on description that you, uh, so, so it is related to parking systems. So in, can, can you recover from your construction, uh, this fighting size motion from your construction? I think I didn't understand the question. Ah, sorry, yeah, so, <laughs> so, so you mentioned this uh, fighting size motion. Yes. So, and, uh, yeah, so my question is that uh, you, you can recover uh, from your, your construction size motion. Yeah, uh, it's a slightly different isomorphism. So, fighting's fixes a formal model and then computes this cohomology group only on the formal model. Uh, whereas I compute it on the original analytic generic fiber, which is something that's actually mm. needed here. Um, mm -hmm. So what I think my theorem applies is because um, but some of this specialization map from the tall topos of the generic fiber to the tall topos of the formal scheme, and I com can compute what happens under pushing forward under this map, so essentially taking matching cycles. And mm -hmm. If you do this, then you recover faulting this isomorphism, I think. But you need that the model is nice. Mm -hmm. you have to yeah, yeah you, have, you need that the model is nice, but... Uh, Which isomorphism is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just... This yeah. isomorphism between the cohomology tensor with of C mod P and the cohomology of this plus mod P sheet. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but in fact, in fact, things, it doesn't consider the rigid detail. It just works it with... Yeah, yeah, it just works on the formal scheme, that's what I yeah. said. Okay, but one can show using your perfect field, it's equivalent to... Yeah. If the, if the formal model is sufficiently nice. So. But the computation of vanishing cycles is easy? Uh, if the formal easier. model is sufficiently nice, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so other questions from Tokyo? Oh, can, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, can, can you prove that the, some uh, toroidal compactation of higher dimensional similar varieties is perfect? Um, I saw a little bit about in, this. In um, well, I certainly expect that it's true, but for the moment I can't prove it, I think. So the problem is the following. So how do I prove it for the minimal compactification? For the minimal compactification, I first prove it on some specific subset called a, neighbor, a strict neighborhood of the anti-canonical tower. So that part goes through, but then for the minimal compactification, I have all of GL2QP acting on them, and so I can moves the subset to all to cover all of the uh, minimal compactification. But if I wanted to do this argument for the toroidal compactification, um, then it can because um, on the toroidal compactification uh, you don't have all the hack operators acting. So it depends on the choice of this cone decomposition and so on. So the hack operators are not acting on it, so this argument of spreading it around doesn't work a priori. Um, yeah. <coughs> you have to make some other argument. So you use the HK operator, so you use GL2? Uh, sorry, I use GL2QP, yeah. Okay. So I show that the subset on which I can control everything explicitly, it's GL2QP translates will cover the whole space. And similarly for Ziegel spaces? Yeah, similarly for Ziegel spaces. I mean, yeah, for Ziegel spaces I use this in vacuum. <coughs> Okay, so uh, maybe there is some other questions from Tokyo or then from Beijing? Oh, okay. Okay, other questions? Maybe that's from Tokyo. Thank you. So from Beijing? Uh, okay, so do you have any questions? No. Oh, okay, so then I have one question. Uh, so in your corollary for 
uh, regular algebraic cascade representations, you construct a Galois representation. Yes. And do you know any uh, thing on the behavior, local behavior of this Galois representation? For instance, do you know the uh, local co global compatibility away from P and uh, the ground is at P? Um, for well, I mean, there's a student of Richard Taylor who was working on these questions, and I, I guess I want, I mean, and the student answers these questions to a large extent. Okay. 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 Okay, thank you. So, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, about the corollary too. Yes. Uh, I mean, there is something mysterious because uh, you don't have an Ishimura variety. Well, as I said, you write this as uh, a such type. No, no, but I mean, the, for the FP, I understand, but now for, you get something about. Well, I mean, you can write this as the cohomology of some local system on this XK. Yeah. And by passing to large level IP, you can also forget about the scope system. And so you essentially just need a version of scolary one, which just which is not only with FP bar coefficients but with Z mod P to the M coefficients. Because then in the inverse limit you will recover what you want. And you get the, the good AK eigenvalue. I mean the Frobenius eigenvalues are the same as the AK. Yes. Yeah. So at all good primes, uh, yeah. So you go over Z over P and Z and you do this. Yes, yeah. Okay. So I use the girl I want for all Z mod P to Z M Zs and then go to Z mod Other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again.